Welcome to part two of our advanced hormone testing tutorial. In this video series, we're going through a number of topics, but in this particular video, we're going to talk about the testing of adrenal hormones, and we're going to be discussing uh, all of the different testing modalities, but specifically with our dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. And it, the, really, the adrenal testing is what drove the development of this test, because if you look at saliva testing, you have the daily free cortisol pattern, but you're really missing metabolized cortisol, which is a test you can get out of urine testing, but in urine testing, you're missing the daily free cortisol pattern. If you don't have the daily free cortisol pattern along with metabolized cortisol, you can really be misled, and we're going to show you some case studies going through that. So when you look at, this is really the crux of the issue in a lot of, a lot of cases, is when you look at this patient, and we're looking at the free cortisol pattern, you can see the expected levels are within the black lines here, but the patient is relatively low. So when you look at that, now this is a urine profile, but if you look in saliva, you, know, you might be used to seeing it this way, where you know this green section here is your normal range, and you've got this patient with very low cortisol all day. And again, you're concluding typically that this patient doesn't make cortisol. And when we look at the saliva and the urine, for the free cortisol, we see similar patterns. So in this study, they looked at controls, they looked at chronic fatigue, and you get this up and down pattern, lower for chronic fatigue, of course, but you get the same pattern in urine and in saliva. So when those free cortisol patterns uh, lead our decision making without confirming it, by looking at metabolized cortisol, we can be off because the model that we've been using really is an oversimplified model that just says, look, if your free cortisol is high, we, some people call that stage one adrenal fatigue, but the overall message is you have an overactive HPA axis. And when you have a low free cortisol, some people call that stage three adrenal fatigue, um, you have an underactive HPA axis and you will start to question this simple uh, model of drawing conclusions about what's going on with the HPA axis when you start looking at a more comprehensive look at the hormones. So here we have two patients. And as we look in here, what we're going to zone in on is on the bottom, we have this daily free cortisol pattern. And both of these patients are low. So the value we're showing at the top here is a 24-hour urine-free cortisol, and it's low for both of these patients. So, so that's low. The free cortisol pattern is low in both, as we just showed before, so similar patterns. And then we want to look also at metabolized cortisol. Now, if you look at the metabolized cortisol, they're different for these two patients, but what you will notice is they're in the thousands for both of them. Right? So even a result that's low on the left is almost 1,800. Now, these are the same units as the free cortisol. It's a little small, so maybe it's hard to see there, but this is 100. So if you hit 100, you're considered high for your free cortisol, yet 1,800 is considered low for metabolized cortisol, meaning that the metabolized cortisol represents a lot more of the produced cortisol, and that's really your best marker, metabolized cortisol, for overall production of cortisol. So now in the patient on the left, we have low free cortisol and low cortisol production. So what does that mean? What that means is the free cortisol story that you're not making much cortisol is confirmed. It's true. The production of cortisol is low, and it's low in both of these areas. But as you look at the patient on the right, the free cortisol is low, but the cortisol production is high. So this message that you're getting that there isn't cortisol production going on is actually an oversimplified message that really isn't reality for this particular patient. These two patients have very different stories uh, as far as their cortisol, uh, but you need more information to discern that. So here's a result that we can see in sort of a real life scenario where we can see this at play. This is actually a friend of mine who tested and we looked at her free cortisol pattern and we noticed that it is low. And so again, we're drawing the conclusion. So here's your 24-hour your urine-free cortisol for this patient is relatively low. And then when you look at metabolized cortisol, you notice what? That it's high. So when I inquired about this patient, what she said is, you know, I have actually low thyroid function. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting because this pattern of having low free cortisol 
and elevated metabolized cortisol is actually more a picture of hyperthyroid. And what it turned out is she was taking her thyroid medication more often than she was supposed to. So it was, in a sense, an overdose of thyroid medication and an induction of hyperthyroid. So what you will see from the literature, and this is actually uh, reasonably well established, is that this cortisol clearance here is actually uh, correlates with thyroid a little bit, that if you have hypothyroid, which we'll look at in a second, uh, you get sluggish clearance. And if you have hyperthyroid, you actually get accelerated clearance of cortisol. But this pattern can also be seen in long-term stress, uh, in obesity, this cortisol clearance is upregulated, and again, this this if you look at her metabolite, she's making more cortisol than 80% of the population, but her free cortisol is low, not because she's not making it, but because she's really burning through that cortisol uh, faster than you'd like to see. So that's a very different picture than you know your your picture of someone who's close to Addison, who's got a really low cortisol production. If we look at this patient here. This is a hypothyroid patient. Now you'll notice the free cortisol is relatively high overall, so the urine free cortisol is high. But the metabolized cortisol is actually extremely low, and this is a fairly extreme case where they had really, really low levels of thyroid. And what does that lead to? Sluggish cortisol clearance. And the other thing that we can see from this test is we look at this cortisol cortisone shuttle, and that looks at the active versus inactive cortisol. And for this patient, she really favors cortisol. So one of the reasons that her cortisol is high is that it's not getting metabolized downstream. But one of the other reasons is in this back and forth as it gets deactivated to cortisone in the kidneys and the colon and the saliva gland, and then it gets reactivated to cortisol, the active form, in the fat and the liver and elsewhere, is it really favors the active cortisol. That pattern is also a correlator to hypothyroidism. So hypo, this is sort of the picture of hypothyroid in terms of the effects on the adrenal glands. And the bottom line here is to get a better picture of what's going on with HPA axis function, whether there's a metabolic issue going on with cortisol or whether there's just a flat out uh, elevated production of cortisol, uh, you really need to look at all three dimensions of cortisol. We wanna look at free cortisol, but we wanna look at free cortisol over different time points. But then we also want to look at how much cortisol is being produced overall, and those three variables are only available with this type of testing. And that really shows uh, the power of this test of really drawing more confident conclusions about what's going on with a particular patient's uh, HPA axis and their cortisol production. So as we look at the, the landscape of testing, with serum testing, you know, you really don't get a lot of information on adrenal hormones. You can test DHEAS. You can look at total cortisol, but looking at a diurnal free cortisol is really not available, and you can't look at the metabolized cortisol, so it's not great for adrenal hormones. Saliva has been considered by many to be the gold standard uh, for salivary or for free cortisol and for HPA axis function. And so, you know, a lot of people are really still using that, and that's a good test, but again, you're missing a huge piece of information with that that can be really misleading in a lot of cases. What I find in our data is that if people have low, flat cortisol patterns, free cortisol patterns, almost half of those people have relatively elevated levels of metabolites. And you know the rest of them are, are on that lower end of the spectrum in terms of cortisol production. But it's a relatively high percent where you're, um, in some sense, misled by that information. So that's why we really prefer this Dutch test for the adrenals. That's really where it excels in terms of giving a more comprehensive picture. For 24-hour urine testing, uh, you can get a diurnal or a, a free cortisol over the whole day, which is a decent bit of information, uh, but you're not getting that pattern. The other thing you have to be careful of with 24-hour urine testing is that a lot of the labs, and probably most of the labs, actually test total cortisol and not free cortisol. So for your sex hormones like testosterone, estrogen, you're looking at total hormones, which includes the phase two conjugates, the glucuronides and the sulfates of these hormones, which is really the way to go in urine for the sex hormones. But for cortisol, it's different. It's more water soluble. There's a higher fraction of free cortisol. But most importantly, when you look in the literature and you look for urine cortisol, 
cortisol, it's pretty much exclusively free cortisol, which is a totally different measurement than a total cortisol. So that's really not as clinically relevant and well established. So be careful with that as you're looking at 24-hour urine testing. But really the, the Dutch test is really a nice option because you're also going to throw in the overnight melatonin value, which then gives even more information relative to what some of these other tests are offering. So this is really the area, the adrenal hormones, where this test really shines. And I think you'll, you'll find if you're used to some of these other tests that it's going to give you a lot more information on these uh, these patients as you're trying to make decisions. So that concludes part two of this video series. If you'll uh, move on to part three, then we'll dig through the sex hormones, your estrogens, your androgens, progesterone, and look at the advantages of the Dutch testing, but also look at what some of the other tests have to offer for those hormones. So this concludes part two of our tutorial, and we thank you for your time and look forward to you watching the rest of the series.